Uh, shifting gears to Yemen, which has been obviously speaking of blockades and uh, all kinds of imperialism has, has been suffering from those things to a very dramatic degree. We have on Shireen El Adimi. She's a Yemeni born anti-war activist and assistant professor at Michigan State University. So thank you so much, Shireen, for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. So I guess a good place to start is, you know, what's been happening recently. Let's start from the what we're what we're hearing in the U.S. because the situation in Yemen in the U.S. is always portrayed, especially when the Saudis or the Emiratis are being targeted by the Houthis, is always portrayed as there's these evil Houthis in Yemen that are, you know, lobbing rockets and firing at the Saudis and the poor Emiratis. And this is the main problem in Yemen is we have to get rid of these Iranian-backed Houthis who are just making it impossible for the country to be at peace. So can you correct the record on what's actually uh, the, the story that's happening in Yemen? The story is that for the past seven years, the Saudi Arabians and the Emiratis, along with full military support from the United States, the UK, France, all sorts of Western governments who've sold them weapons and supported them in many ways, have launched an attack to yes, essentially get rid of the Houthis and restore who they say is the legitimate president of Yemen to power, even though he has no legitimacy among the Yemeni people. Um, and they have used all means possible to achieve this goal, which they haven't been able to achieve after all of these years, shockingly. I mean, it's just um, shocking how incompetent they've been toward this goal. But they've crafted this narrative that the Houthis are Iranian-backed or that even that they're Iranian proxies, which cannot be farther from the truth. Um, they've crafted this narrative that they are trying to stop Iranian influence. I mean, the country's under blockade, land, air, and sea, and so we're still supposed to um, buy into the fiction that somehow Iranians are, first of all, invested in Yemen in that way, and second of all, able to break through this international blockade uh, and supply the Houthis with weapons. And then the other way they've been trying to reframe this as a defensive sort of war. The Emiratis are claiming that they're defending themselves from Houthi rockets and drones. The Saudis are claiming that they're defending themselves from those missiles that sometimes land into Saudi Arabian territory. And the U.S. has the audacity to pretend that they're um, defending Saudi Arabian sovereignty and territory, whereas we know that this has been an asymmetrical um, genocidal war since 2015. And then, you know, when Joe Biden took office, one thing that we heard a lot of progressives excited about was, OK, you know, obviously American foreign policy typically doesn't change between administrations. But surely, surely Joe Biden, unlike Donald Trump, will not just hand Saudi Arabia a blank check to do as it pleases to Yemenis who are suffering from famine like conditions because of this blockade there was there's been like a cholera epidemic in in Yemen uh because of this blockade um surely Biden will stop just giving Saudi Arabia all of these weapons especially after they murdered or chopped up uh Jamal Khashoggi so can you talk a little bit about how has or has policy changed at all from the Trump administration and the Biden administration with respect to the situation in Yemen I mean, it was kind of um, fantastical to imagine that the president, you know, Biden, who this, who was part of the administration that started this war under Obama, would somehow feel compelled to end it in any way. Um, I myself was not, you know, buying into the rhetoric, but I know that. I mean, he was saying all of the right things. He was saying. I was just listening to his campaign response from 2019, November 2019, and he was saying that he was going to stop weapon sales. He said, we can't just let them coming in. They're murdering innocent people. They're murdering, murdering children. Uh, we're you know, going to hold them accountable. And instead, he's done the exact opposite and has just continued Obama's and Trump's violent legacy in Yemen. He continues to sell arms sales, arms to the Emiratis and to the Saudis. Um, he's kind of rebranded this war as defensive instead of offensive, like this distinction did not exist before, and he's added that distinction. Um, and so he continues to support them in all sorts of ways, but now he's saying, well, yeah, we're providing intelligence, but it's for defensive purposes, or we're supporting them with spare parts and maintenance, but it's for defensive purposes, or we're selling arms sales, but you know, they're, it's because they're defending themselves. And so it's kind of 
played this dangerous game of rebranding what hap- what's happening in Yemen. Um, meanwhile, the Yemeni population continues to suffer because of the U.S.'s assistance to the Saudi Arabian coalition. Well, if you and could can you, can talk- you Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Maybe we're going to ask the Please. same question, which is I if bet you, you could we talk are. more I about the are. humanitarian toll. I mean, it's become now kind of a meme, the world's worst humanitarian crisis. But, uh, you know, not only the toll, but the deliberate policies of the air forces of, of Saudi Arabia and UAE and others. Um, maybe I'm editorializing, but what seems like deliberate policies to increase the suffering. I mean, the UN has called this targeting of civilians, quote, systematic and um, deliberate. And so they have been from the very beginning deliberate, deliberately targeting food sources, targeting people in their homes and their vehicles in their um, mosques and funerals and weddings. I mean, nothing. I mean, these are this is the coalition that bombed a bus full of school children, knowing that they were school children. Um, and so there have been no red lines for this coalition that we're backing. And um the, I think also it's important to understand that in the first 48 hours, Yemen's defense capabilities, air defense capabilities were grounded. In just the 40, first 48 hours, the coalition was able to come in through the surprise attack and um, the Houthis have not had any control. I mean, they don't have control over a single helicopter, let alone F-15s, F-16s, whatever it is that the coalition are use, is using. So the when that didn't work, when they thought that this, what they called Operation Decisive Storm, uh, didn't end in two weeks like they had imagined. When That's when they started to really use other means. So the blockade, targeting fuel sources, targeting our agriculture, uh, preventing the entry of food and medicine and you know people out of the, in and out of the country. Um, that's when they kind of escalated all of these ways to try to bring the Houthis to surrender, essentially. And at the beginning, it wasn't just the Houthis. It was the Houthis and former President Saleh. But um, they've used anything at their disposal, including the use of aid, even weaponizing aid during the Trump administration uh, and designating the Houthis as terrorists, which is one of the last things he did. And that, of course, would have spelled out a death sentence to millions of Yemenis who rely on aid because of the blockade and because of this war. Um, Biden, by the way, is threatening to redesignate them as terrorists, which would, uh, again, like I said, spell genocide for about 80, you know, 80% of the population, about 22 million people. You know... Shireen... No, no. (laughs) We keep doing that. That's fun. No, no, no. You first and then me. Well, I I was just going to say, I mean, it just seems... And you've already sort of spoken to this, but it just seems fantastical to me that there's that. I mean, it's obviously an extension of the U.S. attempt to destroy Iran, to isolate Iran in many different ways. That they're taking many of these policies, and it just, but it just seems extraordinary to me that anyone can be arguing that there's massive Iranian aid coming into the country when, on the same token, you're hearing from the UN and others that they can barely get anything in food, medical supplies, or whatever it may be. I mean, I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about that blockade aspect because I think most Americans feel like, you know, there's like a thousand planes a day flying into Yemen with Iranian missiles on them. Yeah, I mean, so the Houthis control uh, northern Yemen, former what was then known, you know, pre-1990 known as North North Yemen, and they control most of that uh, area. And that's where about 70 to 80 percent of the Yemeni population lives. And in that area where most of the population lives, there's not a single functioning airport. Recently, they opened up Sana'a Airport for UN missions only. So only UN personnel are allowed to come in and out of that airport. The population of Yemen is not does not have access to any of those airports. And so, you know, people have died. Countless of people have died trying to you know, they can't receive medical aid in the country and they can't go abroad for medical aid. So there are two airports open in the south of Yemen, um, and that's what the coalition controls. But, you know, most of the population lives in the north, like I said. And then the ports. And so they've uh, blockaded the ports. They control Yemeni airspace. They control Yemeni lands, the borders, the seaport, the seaports. And they hold fuel ships. So even fuel ships that have been cleared by the system that the UN came with to try to I mean, to try to exactly actually check for Iranian weapons coming in through the ports. Um, and they clear these ships for entry into Yemen, and the Saudis and the Emiratis still hold them in those docks. They hold food, ships carrying food, they hold ships carrying fuel for months at a time. 
uh, before they would let them in. And then even when they let them in, there's only a very small percentage, about 20% of what the country actually needs. And again, they've prevented Yemenis from trade. So prior to the war, Yemen used to import 90% of its food. This is the, country, the Middle East's poorest country. Um, and without that import ability, 80% of the population has now relied on this aid, which they then weaponize and use as, um, as a way to control the Houthi. So it's an absolutely devastating you know, consequence to this country that poses no threat to anyone, no legitimate threat to anyone, not even the Houthis with the few missiles that they were able to send and the few drones that landed here and there. You know, if Iran was in fact selling, you know, providing weapons, where are these weapons? Where have they gone? How many civilians have they killed? And the answer is what, five people maybe, you know, Saudi Arabians and Emiratis versus 350,000 Yemenis who have been killed already and, you know, a child dying every 75 seconds. That's what we're really talking about here. And can you maybe elaborate a little bit on the role that the Western governments, particularly the U.S. and the U.K., are playing here? Because a lot of times it's always, no, this is a Saudi war, this is a Saudi war. But we know that it would not be possible. Like the, the U.S. and U.K. could shut this down tomorrow if they wanted to. Absolutely. I mean, I've said this before, but the Saudis are incompetent and the Emiratis are incompetent. They make no weapons. They rely entirely on weapon exports, imports. Um, and the U.S. provides most of those weapons. And then countries like Canada, of course, and, you know, at various times, Germany and Spain, Australia, France, so forth, U.K. Uh, but U.S. and U.K. have played a significant role. So they play an advising role. There are um, UK and US commanders in the command room, helping them choose targets that they target around Yemen. We know most of these targets have been civilian targets. Um, and even when they're not civilian targets, you know, military targets or whatnot, they, they don't really care how many civilians are killed. Um, and the US also provides, um, under Trump, this ended under Trump in late 2018, but all throughout the Obama years and the first couple of years of the Trump administration, they were providing mid-air refueling. So you can imagine Saudi and Marathi jets flying in the air in Yemeni airspace, and a U.S. jet supplying them with fuel as they were flying in Yemeni airspace. I mean, that is a partner in the war. That's not just the Saudis. That's the U.S. Air Force providing weapons and capabilities to the Saudi-led coalition. Um, they continue to maintain their vehicles, their aircrafts, provide logistical support, provide spare parts. They train Saudi soldiers and um and pilots and Emirati pilots as well. So they're doing everything essentially, except for, oh, and, you know, and all of these bombs that we've seen drop on Yemeni civilians, you know, you, you can trace them back to Lockheed Martin or Raytheon um, or whatever other defense, U.S. defense company. And so they've done everything except send ground troops. Um, and then they say, oh, we're not, we're not part of this war. We want a diplomatic solution in Yemen. And they act like they're a neutral party and they're not a neutral party. They're a party to the war. And is there anything happening in the U.S. Congress on this now? I mean, I know at one point a couple years ago, it seemed like a number of people, Senator Bernie Sanders, others were starting to speak up, say more about it. I mean, a lot of that, of course, is in the context of the presidential election with people uh, sort of positioning for, you know, what they would do if they were president. So, I mean, is there anyone pushing anything that could perhaps change the U.S. position? When this was Obama's war, hardly anybody in Congress was interested and even acknowledging the U.S.'s role in this war, with the exception of, um, at the time, it was Chris Murphy, and you know he uh, worked with Rand Paul to try to, to uh, stop certain uh, weapon sales to Saudi Arabia. And then throughout the Trump presidency is when we were able to build a lot of momentum against this war, against U.S. support for this war. And they finally came around to seeing how devastating this was and how crucial the U.S.'s role was in uh, providing, you know, continuing this war. And eventually, after years and years of trying, I mean, this was like lots of grassroots work, lots of activism. Um, Ro Khanna in the House and Sanders in the Senate managed to lead through this bill, the War Powers Resolution, which has, you know, been on the, it's been federal law since 1973, and no Congress has ever challenged a sitting president on, on this, uh, on illegal wars, because it turns out, and I don't know if the American public knows this, it turns out that a president can't just declare war, it has to go through Congress, yet every president since 1973, since this act uh, went into became uh, law has violated this, but they were never challenged until 2019, until this passed through both chambers with bipartisan support. What happened was that Trump vetoed it. And um, the fact that he can even veto it is a problem here because they are saying that, hey, you're in violation of the constitution. He's like, well, I don't care. 
uh, that shouldn't be a mechanism that's allowed. But ever since Biden became president and uh, kind of made this announcement that he's ending offensive operations, it seems like Congress has lost steam. It seems that they have taken him at his word. Um, even some longtime anti, you know, Yemen war advocates like Chris Murphy, I mentioned, even, you know, agreed to sell weapons to the Saudi Arabians just a couple months ago, which is just astonishing to me after all the work that he did. And he is citing offensive versus defensive, this, you know, made up dichotomy that we're hearing now. Um, so they haven't made much movement. We've been trying to push for another war powers to try to get Biden to force Biden to um not continue to violate, you know, the constitution again on legal grounds because moral grounds don't seem to have gone very far. Um, I know that there's some interest, but I haven't seen any concrete, you know, we haven't seen a war powers act being invoked just yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting too, how even regionally, um, this is more of a comment, but you're, like, I'd love to get your response. But even regionally, Saudi Arabia has bullied countries across the Middle East in keeping quiet about this. You know, Lebanon, where I live, has been, yeah, has been experiencing this economic collapse, and the country's really on its knees right now. And a few months ago, the former, now former, infor, er, uh, information minister in Lebanon had, you know, the Saudis dug up something of him, like basically criticizing their war very lightly and saying the Yemenis are defending themselves and made this huge deal about it and actually cut Lebanon off from exporting anything to Saudi Arabia and even made threats against the Lebanese who were in Saudi Arabia saying that we'll deport them all. And uh, the UAE followed suit and so did Kuwait and all these other countries, which just kind of do whatever Saudi Arabia tells them to. Um, so even regionally, the Saudis, because of how de- how how integral they are to the economy in the Middle East and how many people from poor Middle Eastern countries are working in Saudi Arabia, they use it as a weapon to shut down criticism about the war in Yemen. And I guess off of that, I'd want to ask, you know, in terms of the lobbying apparatus in the U.S., we know Saudi Arabia has a bit of a lobbying apparatus. So do the Emiratis. They also have media outlets. They also fund a lot. They give so much money to these Beltway think tanks that receive it from the Saudis or the UAE. So can you talk a little bit about their role in propagandizing on this issue? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in the region, they've basically either coerced or wrangled a a few countries to be part of the coalition. Um, Countries like Morocco was part of the coalition until 2019. Countries like Egypt was part of the coalition at some point, Jordan and so on. Um, And of course, all of the Gulf countries, except for Oman and Qatar, after their spat with Saudi was kicked out of the coalition. Uh, But critique is very limited and um, uh, any kind of critique is weaponized against those people in those countries, like you've mentioned with the case in Lebanon, which Yemenis have been following with interest. Um, And it kind of highlights like how lonely they felt in that region, like the world's most, you know, powerful countries have ganged up on them, choked them off from uh, basic, you know, human rights. And uh, nobody even gets to say this is wrong, right? This is not acceptable without consequences. And in the UN, of course, they've also, the Saudis have applied this pressure, trying to get themselves off of lists of uh, shame for being, for murdering Yemeni children and using money as a way to leverage that and to um, get the UN to do what they want or, you know, get the UN to not make even most recently in December, the UN had um, tried to get a, a private or an independent body to investigate war crimes in Yemen, which is not the first time this has happened. But again, we see almost seven years into the war that the Saudis shut it down and they've just continued with the self-assessing body. It's basically a Saudi-made body that investigates its own war crimes. And then they say, oh, no, we've done nothing wrong. Everything is fine. Um, So they have all of, and then in the U.S., you know, last time I checked, the Emiratis alone were spending about $26 million a year on on PR um, for their war efforts. And so we're up against a lot of money, a lot of people, a lot of power, a lot of influence. And yet we still were able to pass the war powers resolution, which is something that I think is very significant that when the average American knows that our country is involved in creating the world's worst humanitarian crisis, people get you know upset about hearing exactly what's happening. You don't always hear in the headline that this is a U.S. backed war or how is it a U.S. backed war. But every now and then, for example, last year when CNN sent a as a reporter, essentially, she had to Nema gather. She had to smuggle her way into Yemen because the Saudis wouldn't give her a visa. And she reported on the blockade and how it was U.S. supported. And the first thing the, the U.S. did was deny the 
even the existence of a blockade. So this is what we're up against. Um, but I think that um, there's still a lot of will to continue to push back and to continue to do the right thing, which is, you know, we have no control about what's ha- over what's happening in Yemen, nor should we. Uh, but we have a lot of control about what our elected officials say and do and the war crimes to which they're complicit. Uh, and we need to absolutely hold them accountable, you know, not beg and you know, plead with them to really demand that if they want our votes to stop um, complicity with war crimes in Yemen. Mm-hmm. Well, Shireen, I have to say, we really, really appreciate you coming here on the show and helping us sort through this and understand all these, these crucially important issues with what's going on in Yemen. I know you've undoubtedly got a lot going on, so thanks for making some time for us here on the Freedom Side. Thanks so much for covering this topic.